view of some of the issues of some of the issues that uh, let me just get rid of this um, that have been covered in this particular um, journal issue um, and uh, have impacted on what you're going to uh, be listening to, de to today. Um, and before that, a big thank you to everyone who has contributed. So we have we have four people here um, who have contributed um, articles and uh, voices of dissent um, pieces, um, but we also have um, others. So please do have a look and um, hopefully some of those people will be here today and will be able to contribute. So um, from within feminist dissent and outside, there have been many activists and academic conversations um, where we've experienced free speech as the first casualty of all forms of authoritarianism and religious fundamentalisms. Um, and whilst freedom of speech is a political idea, um, we can't speak of it in the abstract. So what we're, what we're going to be talking about, and, and this issue of feminist dissent is very much about, is, is linking um, fem freedom of speech to specific historical and social formations and struggles for secularism and democracy. So this issue, including the essays and the um, voices of dissent pieces, um, all, of, all of these pieces seek ways to understand how freedom of speech is weaponized or threatened in complex and very different historical and social circumstances and in ways that serve to undermine the principle um, as a key value of democracy that's pretty much shared by people globally, um, even if governments deny it. Um, and they all show that there's no easy answers to the questions that we posed when we originally um, talked about um, this issue. Um, all of the contributions show the paradoxes and the complexities of the many different contexts where free speech is under attack. Um, and together they indicate the conjunctions of challenges to freedom of, of speech experienced in states with authoritarian governments and in liberal democracies, in regions where fundamentalist religious re regimes hold state power and where they appear to contest those state powers in countries where activists are targeted by governments and where they are, they are opposed by other activists. Um, but towards the end of the introduction, you'll see that um, we, we try to show how the articles collectively indicate our early signs, warning signs of increasing risks to freedom of speech that require vigilance from all of us, um, from where they might first emerge as something which is a, a for seemingly insignificant criticism of ideas or ways of living um, or the targeting of minority interests. Um, and that, that's something that I hope we're going, is going to come up in the discussion. So um, as well as the written pieces, um, the issue um, includes the work of poets um, and artists which challenge attacks on free speech through the deep reflections on issues that are targeted. Um, and the, in, in this, we've got um, the poetry of uh, um, Antonia Dada and the art of Huria Nyati, um, which show the global importance of the continual shared fight of, for freedom of expression. So please do have a look at the journal and the artwork, which is um, really central to it. And those together with um, Pulumi Desai's pandemic inspired artwork um, run throughout the issue. Um, and then of course, we um, conclude the issue with um, with some very appropriate um, book reviews, um, which I hope you also get a chance to, um, to read. So finally, bringing this issue together took far longer than planned. Um, and we were continuously updating it um, as, we, as we were um, reviewing uh, essays and pieces and indeed in writing the introduction. So, you know, we all know that it's a very fast moving um, situation and each of the contexts um, are changing in other ways. So this launch is um, an opportunity to extend that discussion. Um, so I think we're gonna start doing that right now. Um, so the order today is um, we're going to start off with um, Stephen Cowden uh, talking about the paper um, that he and uh, Neera Yuval Davis wrote. Um, it's, it's titled Contested Narratives of the Pandem Pandemic Crisis, 
the far right, anti-vaxxers and freedom of speech. Um, before handing over to Stephen, can I just ask that everybody make sure that their um, microphones are turned off? Um, and I will turn off mine. Um, Stephen, you've got 12 minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Great. OK. Yeah, thanks very much for that introduction, Georgie. Um, yes, just to... Just to reiterate, this is a, a piece that Nira Yuval Davis, who's also a, a member of the Feminist Ascent Collective, Nira and I wrote this piece because we felt that the whole question of um, you know, freedom of speech needed to be um, really addressed in relation to the COVID pandemic because it's had such huge implications. So essentially what we tried to talk about in this article was why the way the extreme right created the political space around opposition to COVID vaccinations and public health restrictions. And the way this represented for them a major opportunity to place their conspiratorial vision of society before a wider audience. So while the language they used uh, was a language of victimization and a demand for free speech, these were masks for the deep authoritarianism and profound racism and misogyny of their, of their views. Now, it's important to note the way that um, anti-vaxxer conspiracy theories dominated public and media concern about the management of the pandemic. And, and in doing so, they silenced a lot of the real implications that the pandemic had, particularly for, for poor people, for women and for racialized minorities. A 2020 UN report noted that the pandemic impacted on women in terms of their deteriorating economic situation, negative impact in terms of health and health care, the major increase in unpaid caring work, which women had to do through the pandemic, not to mention the, the um, increase in violence against women and girls and lack of access to services, support services in relation to that. Um, and the fact is that, that that UN report I referred to was written three years ago, but there has not been in the UK any major reckoning with the impact of the pandemic on the poor, on black and minority ethnic communities, the disproportionate impact on the poor, on black and minority ethnic communities and women. Um, so the, 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 the far right used the pandemic as a moment to, mat, to uh, mobilize and used it very successfully. Now at the center of their, um, at the center of their ideas or their ideology is the idea of what's known as white replacement theory. So these conceptions of white replacement articulate a mortal threat to the white race from ongoing immigration and state-sponsored multiculturalism. And in our article, Nira and I looked at the way this theme, which develops initially around um, concerns around multiculturalism and migration, has transformed and morphed into the area of anti-vaccination and COVID-denying conspiracy theories. So where do these extreme right movements come and why are they enjoying the dynamism they are at the moment? Um, we see these movements, which have both secular and religious manifestations, as a manifestation of neoliberalism's political and economic crisis of governability and governmentality. They're global movements which are emerging in the context of ballooning inequality and insecurity. Um, they emerge, in the words of Wendy Brown, from the ruins of neoliberalism. So politically, they're also expressions of profound disillusionment with representative democracy and liberalism. Um, indeed, they they seem to they they aim to extinguish the entire political basis of liberalism. They present themselves to the wider public, not necessarily using the exp explicit language of white supremacism they clearly believe in, but the coming together of virtuous people taking a stance against the forces of evil, exposing corruption, standing up for ordinary people, etc. Donald Trump's description of the QAnon conspiracy group as uh, a group which was consisted of people who basically believe in good government was a clear manifestation of that. Um, so in asserting their freedom to speak out, they are throwing off their passive role as victims and telling people really what is going on. And that was very much the language they used throughout the pandemic. So 
Nira and I argued that when the world is experienced as a frightening and confusing place, when the anchoring reference points of meaning have been wrenched from their moorings, these conspiracy narratives form a powerful rallying cry for their supporters and they offer people new anchors. The far right has created a community of shared meaning and acceptance around this. So despite the substantive irrational content, from the point of view of the situated voice of believers, the, the, um, the, this, their growth represents a dilemma for feminists and the left in finding a way to present alternatives to this. And I'll come to that at the end. So the relationship between religious fundamentalist movements, which were at the center of, center of feminist dissent concerns, and the secular extreme right is one that's ebbed and flowed historically. Damon Berry has noted that many white nationalists see Christianity as too Jewish or too alien an ideology that weakened the racial instincts of Europeans. So the concerns of the, the secular extreme right has always been forms of racist nationalism, while Christian fundamentalist mobilizing passion has been the control of women's reproductive rights, LGBT communities, which they see these as expressions of, as, as Michelle Goldberg has called, living signifiers of decadence and corruption. We want to argue in this piece that the theme of white replacement offers a space in which these different preoccupations could converge. And a really good example of this is the America First Political Action Conference, a far right group led by the avid blogger and um, uh, internet influencer, Nick Fuentes. And uh, he uses these, he's, he comes, you know, he's, represents this synthesis of the extreme Christian fundamentalism and the extreme right you coming together around white men placement theories. He was recently interviewed and uh, he argued that if you change the people in America and you change the place that is America, is it still our home? The answer to me is no. Yeah. So the way the whole notion at the center of this um, form of conspiracy theory around white replacement is that white people become strangers in their own homes. They're no longer uh, rec represented or recognized there. They are the victims of um, migration and um, state-sponsored multiculturalism. And this points to the way um, the, the religious fundamentalists and the extreme, the secular extreme right can merge and form an alliance around this idea of white replacement theory. And in his speech to the, to the conference in 2021, Fuentes said, if America loses its white demographic core and it loses its faith in Jesus Christ, then it is not America anymore. So, you know, this really shows you the, the the, the the dangers we're facing where these two these groups are coalescing around these um these these ideas and of course this is not something unique to the united states which is what nira and i wrote about quite considerably in the article but we can see the same kind of synthesis of you know religious fundamentalism and racist identity politics emerging in hungary india turkey and israel all of which are showing that kind of thing. So the ideological form of conspiracy theory and the way this is shared across the online space particularly is very central to the development. So while conspiracy theories have always existed on the left and the right, we see the role these are playing in developing the dynamism of the extreme right as crucial. Um, essentially, the far right use conspiracy theory as a form of disinformation. It's very important to understand that. They are essentially, it is active disinformation. And in the recent uh, talk on freedom of speech as part of the BBC Reef Lectures, the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie put this distinctly when she argued that the new form of right wing politics was seeking to, quote, undermine the very notion of accepted fact based truth above politics. And this is, again, the, an attack on the sort of principles of liberalism that they are, that they are manifesting. Um, now, Michael Butter, in his book, The Nature of Conspiracy Theories, argues 
again develops this argument. The, the, the important thing that he notes, it's not so much how widely conspiracy theories are believed at the moment, that actually the extent of their belief is less than at other historical periods, he notes. Rather, it's the role played by the internet. Not only has this made conspiracy theories so much more accessible, but it has itself been a catalyst for the fragmentation of the public sphere. In other words, there's a mutually reinforcing relationship between the far right online space, and the decline of a common public sphere of debate where those views can be challenged. And this has, you know, very significant implications for freedom of speech. Um, so really, um, there's there's kind of two key points I want to kind of sort of wrap up with. Um, the first is that sort of how we how we think about the growth of the extreme right and the way they very successfully mobilised around the COVID pandemic and the full extent of those is is is. Um, we present a lot more evidence for how that worked with, within our article, which I very much hope you can read. Um, I think one of the real challenges facing left feminist and anti-racist politics around the far right is there is far too much thinking in silos. Um, a good example is the book White Skin, Black Fuel, uh, recently written by Andreas Mahm and the Zetkin Collective, which looks at the, the way the far right are using the issue of climate change and its relationship to migration. It's, it's an excellent book in many ways, but the focus on the extreme right is entirely in terms of racism and Islamophobia. The question of gender is barely touched on. And this is one of the things I think we, we've really got to get our heads around. Um, and the argument that Nira and I made in this article points to the way racism and misogyny are deeply entwined within these new forms of authoritarianism. So Chaitan Bat, in his work on, on white replacement theory, has noted that white replacement theories merge biological and cultural metaphors in complex ways. So white replacement theory connects ultra-conservative section conceptions of gender and extreme forms of xenophobia in that both are concerned with the reproduction of the white family by bi biologically as well as socially and culturally. The patriarchal family is biologically the place where the white demographic is created, as well as being the moral bedrock of society whose upstanding values are being spoiled, tainted and corrupted by equality initiatives within the state, women's rights, LGBT rights, immigration and multiculturalism. So extreme xenophobia and the defense of patriarchal in the family merge with the, with, the, with the ideas where the, where the secular far right and the Christian far right, the Christian right can meet through a concern about the physical reproduction of white children whose presence ensures that America remains this white nation. Yeah, It also represents the reproduction of a domestic sphere based on traditional represent gender roles and the power relations that represent the subordinate position of women. So it's essential to see that these theories absolutely synthesize extreme forms of racism and misogyny and that's without even mentioning the the far-right manosphere uh which is in the, those extreme misogynist sort of forms which again showing the form of the, the dynamic dynamic forms of the far right it's morphing constantly into these new forms Stephen, we have so, to wind up okay great so do you want to finish off yeah, 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 yeah. So just really to just to return, just to come to the question of, of freedom of speech. Yeah, I think there are, there's really two tasks for us in, in, in around the question of freedom of speech. The first is an epistemological struggle. And second is an organizational struggle. Epistemologically, it's absolutely crucial that we defend reason and evidence. And, and the pandemic shows how important medical and epidemiological information was to protect the public. But more important than this, questions of free speech allowed people to keep hold of the truth in a very difficult, distressing and, and, and constantly changing situation. Freedom of speech allowed people to keep hold of the truth. That's ex extremely important. Secondly, I think it's very important to see the forms of COVID conspiracy theories simply as unreason. And in their book, Dialectic of Enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer note that one 
one of the lessons Hitler taught us is that it's better not to be too clever. Cleverness becomes meaningless as soon as power ceases to obey the rules and chooses direct appropriation instead. And this is exactly what the extreme right did. Uh, they sought to directly appropriate power. Now, their stupidity failed them in this instance, but they have not in any sense gone away. And the task of defeating them is essentially a political and organisational task. Thank you. Stephen, and I can see that there's been a conversation I apologise, I, I leapt into um, your, your paper without introducing you properly, but for people who just come in and, and Stephen is Senior Lecturer in Social Work um, at the University of Gloucestershire, um, and he was a co-editor of our Feminist Dissent uh, Journal Number no. 4, which looked at the Prevent Policy in the UK, and he's a member of the um, Feminist Dissent Editorial Collective, so sorry Stephen, I didn't introduce you. Um, but now we move on to our second speaker, who is um, Mariam Namazi. Um, Mariam is an Iranian-born writer and activist living in the UK. She's the spokesperson of One Law for All and the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain. Um, she is involved in many, many um, different uh, activist uh, organisations and um, is specifically going to be talking about her paper on which is called on censoring of TED talk to update um, us with um, some of the um, events and implications of what's happening in Iran at the moment and which um, wasn't happening in the same way when this issue went. Mariam, over to you. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, uh, Feminist Dissent, for organizing this discussion. To the other wonderful panelists who are here with me uh, and, and all of you who are here uh, both to listen and also to comment and help us uh, discuss this issue further. Uh, my paper in the uh, Feminist Dissent issue was on the censorship of a talk I gave at TEDx Warwick. Uh, but there's so many aspects to um, this discussion that I'd like to focus, I guess, on an aspect of it, um, uh, which is, I guess, something that I've been grappling with in my work. And I think that we don't all agree on as well. And be because it is a dilemma, really, for those of us who defend free speech and free expression. Um, let me start by saying that I think the title, you know, if we can't talk, if we can't debate together, we can't live together. And I think that's a really important reiteration of this need to talk, to express ourselves uh, for, for many different reasons. One is, of course, to create understanding, to increase tolerance of those who are considered other, to gain recognition, to gain rights that we don't have, to challenge the powerful, because in fact, really, free speech is and free expression is a right of the powerless vis-a-vis -vis those in power and, and to change the status quo. And oftentimes, for me as an activist, I feel really it's the only thing I have at my disposal to show my rage, to show, uh, you know, how unjust things are and how and to try to change things. It's really the only thing I have in the sense of not just speech, but uh, protest in various forms, including using my body as a form of political protest to, to various other actions. Um, and so, you know, for me, I think it is a hugely important right. I can understand why, uh, you know, we talk about it as being a cornerstone to other rights, because if we can't speak, if we can't express ourselves, um, it's very hard for us to change things and to defend rights. So I think one of the problems though is because obviously rights contest, you know, there's contestation of rights. Sometimes defending one's rights is seen to be a challenge to other people who might have privileges or, or are comfortable. And it is a very uncomfortable thing. I mean, to be honest, very often, when I do speak 
uh, it, it's not really, I think, to me, because a lot of time is uncomfortable, but I feel like I have no how to do that because how else am I going to is necessary how can I open up the space how can I break taboos how can I challenge the status quo and if we look at for example you know even the name ex-Muslim very often it's considered a provocation an unnecessary provocation and um, to be honest I don't even really like the label you know uh, I think um it's, it's not something I would ever call myself previous to starting the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. I'm an atheist. I'm a free thinker. I am definitely anti-religion um, whilst respecting people's right to believe in any rubbish they want. Um, but I, um, I think the use of the term ex-Muslim is very useful in showing, one, that the so-called Muslim community is not homogenous, that there are and also, it's a way of showing that we exist um, because there's so much silence and censorship around dissent, particularly if you're dealing with what's considered a minority community that is facing racism and bigotry. And rightly so, people want to make sure that that's stopped and curtailed. But then it raises the question of what happens to minorities within minorities who are not allowed to speak and to challenge. Uh, so I think uh, for it, so this is a dilemma really, and I always find it interesting how you have you know in in many places where I've been banned or barred from speaking, you have Islamists who are really you know the religious right, the religious fundamentalists, like other religious fundamentalists, like Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists, Buddhist, Hindu fundamentalists who won't get as easy red carpet treatment as the Islamists do because it's seen to be a minority religion. Therefore, they can people versions or women, um, you know, should be stoned to death. Um, with someone like myself that them is a human right, it's us that's labeled controversial, inflammatory, even inciting hate. And uh, part of it, of course, is the privilege that religion has. Um, um, and also the privilege men have very often. I find that it's, you know, the restrictions are very much on, on women. And what we say being labeled as hate speech, and no matter how much one explains that you're criticizing Islam, which is a belief like all others, a very bad belief in my opinion, as all religions are, misogynist, homophobic, inhuman, and really, um, you know, ideas that have to be and must be criticized. Uh, but also the religious right movement that is wreaking havoc as we speak, that is murdering people from Iran, Afghanistan, to putting bombs in discotheques and on underground stations. So you know, very much a, a movement and ideas and beliefs that need to be criticized. But it's very often seen as um, an attack on Muslims. And, uh, and no matter how much you say it isn't, I can understand why people feel that way, because I feel that way about other things. You know, when I hear uh, the Tories talk about migrants, I know it's just speech and there's freedom of speech. It's not a good example because they are those in power, but let's say the regular person on the street that wants migrants thrown into the sea without power, who's also powerless. I can understand how those of us who are pro-migrants I'm for open borders will think that what that person says could lead to incitement to violence, could lead to a climate in which asylum centers are set on fire and uh, migrants are killed and their, their criminalization and dehumanization can mean that they can die at our very borders and no one bats an eyelid. Uh, so I can understand this 
perspective, very often I think coming from a good place that says, well, if you as ex-Muslims criticize Islam, you are creating an environment that makes it unsafe for Muslims, that increases bigotry. And I guess the question then for me is, well, what are the, what, where are the lines? Is it where I say the line is? Is it where you say the line is? Um, is it speech that's unpalatable? To be honest, I find a lot of speech unpalatable, as I'm sure many of you do here in this room. So where, where is that line? And I feel like the line has to be that speech should be free, unequivocally free, except where it's inciting violence. And I know that's not a line we all agree with. And I myself grapple with that dilemma. Is that enough? But on the other hand, I feel that, you know, for personally, I um, when I hear verses of the Quran, it is hate speech against free women like myself. It is hate speech against ex-Muslims, apostates, blasphemers. Um, and it often leads to incitement to violence and murder as we see in, in many places. So I think that's one, one issue that for me is, um, you know, a, a major question, but also, and, and I've got just a few more minutes left. I do want to talk about this idea of what's happening. For example, we're watching a woman's revolution unfold in Iran. Women are burning their hijabs. There's a huge level of anti-clericalism, uh, the turban flying phenomenon where young people run up behind clerics and throw their turbans off, an anti-Islamic backlash that can be seen. And we are hearing, again, this sort of, well, if you have this perspective, it's Islamophobia. And that's often, in my opinion, used to silence criticism and to censor and bring blasphemy laws and apostasy laws where they don't exist. And I guess the question is, well, how else can we speak? How else can we show our outrage at religion and the religious right, whilst at the same time respecting human beings, uh, but not respecting beliefs and definitely not respecting racist, inhuman political and social movements uh, uh, and being able to challenge power. So I think, I guess I just wanted really to bring this dilemma in a sense, something that I'm always grappling with. Um, I just have another minute to say, but I have, I have the story where I went to speak to um, minority students, minoritized students in the Netherlands. And after I spoke to them, a teacher told me that one of the girls who considered herself a Muslim, she came from a Muslim family. She was really excited to meet with me because most probably she had some questions about Islam, but she was so offended when she saw me carrying the Allah's gay sign at Pride, that uh, she was disturbed and really upset by it. And I honestly, when I heard this, I started crying <laughs> uncontrollably. It still makes me cry every time I, want, I even talk about it. And it's this idea that you don't wanna hurt people's feelings. You don't want to um, upset people, but at the same time, you have a right to speak. and. This, you can say this, but you can say this, but be nicer. You can say this, but don't offend. Well, Islam offends me. Religion offends me. A lot of things offend me. The Iranian regime offends me. And we have to be able to speak, even if it is offensive, even if others might consider it hateful, as long as we're not inciting violence, as long as we hold people sacred, but not ideas, beliefs and political social movements and those in power that are using um, this sort of accusations of Islamophobia and offense to silence and censor. So I think I'm gonna leave it there. That's my 12 minutes. Thank you for letting me share that with you. Thank you very much, Mariam. Um, and hopefully you'll get the chance to um, discuss in a bit more detail when we get to the questions as well and definitely the piece that you wrote on the specific example of the, the TED talk um, is I'd really recommend that um, if people haven't yet read it to, to please have a look at that. Thank you very much. Um, so so now we're going to um, move on to Salil Tripathi who's going to be talking about um, <clears throat> in relation to the paper that he wrote um, women and online harassment 
Um, Salil is an Indian-born uh, writer based in New York. Um, he's worked as a foreign correspondent and is an award-winning journalist. Um, from 2015 to 2021, he chaired the Penn International Writers in Prison Committee um, and is presently um, a member of its board. So thank you very much, Salil. Thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting me to A, to write, B, with such wonderful contributors, including some friends like Mariam, and C, of course, to speak today. So thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, I'll speak, I mean, Mariam's uh, presentation uh, led to many thoughts in my mind, and I'll, I hope we'll get the chance to address some of them. I'm completely in agreement with almost everything Mariam has said, so it's not going to challenge but hopefully help amplify some of the points you made. But I have 12 minutes, so I should stick to what I need to talk, talk about my paper. Uh, the starting premise that I had with this paper was this idea that internet was a great equalizer, that it was going to make space accessible and open to everyone. It was going to allow the meek to inherit the earth, to speak truth to power, uh, and it was going to level the playing field. That was the assumption. What has happened though is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak largely about women writers in this uh, session and, and take, taking it beyond speech, including participating in the public space uh, as we go along. There are a couple of premises I want to make. One is that there is this assumption that online speech is just online speech. If Mariam says something that I don't like and I say something abusive to her, it ends there, it doesn't. One of the things that we have learned from the work of both Amnesty, uh, Human Rights Watch, and Pan International itself, if you look at it, uh, and Pan America, they've done a very good report on it too, is a continuum between online uh, attacks and offline real physical violence. And there are cases that I will talk about as we go along. And it begins by silencing, it begins by organized mobs coming and stopping people from speaking. Um, ridiculing um, uh, uh, women speakers, undermining their, trying to undermine their contribution and their worth, making sexist comments or sexualizing the language. That is something that most women I know who are journalists, activists, or human rights defenders face routinely, routinely. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's the, uh, and they have to develop the proverbial thick skin in, in handling that. And kudos to those who stay. But I'm going to to talk about the kind of decisions people have made in, as I go along. So one of the people I start my paper with is the British science writer Angela Saini, who has written several very good books. In fact, her latest book is called Patriarchs. But when I was writing the paper, it, was, it wasn't out yet, uh, Inferior and Superior. Now, she uses science as an argument to challenge a lot of notion which can be problematic. And, you know, we were talking about racializing of uh, the response to COVID. And she looked at the British Health, uh, National Health Service statistics and looked at it and challenged some of the assumptions that were governing uh, how the treatments were being meted out at that time, you know, an article which I think she wrote for Nature. But when she makes an argument that takes a purely scientific argument from the scientific realm, and when she moved it and took it forward to what seemed like a political plane, the amount of attack she, attack she had was so, I mean, the, the attacks were so vicious that she first got out of Facebook then she got out of Twitter. She now posts occasionally on Instagram when she speaks, or she posts occasionally on LinkedIn. And very often she turns off comments that people can make. Now, this is a net loss to the society because, you know, I mean, but one doesn't have to agree with every argument Angela makes, but hers is an important intellectual voice. She is a qualified scientist and she writes on science in an accessible manner. And this, the global intellectual discourse has lost it, at least in these two very robust, uh, uh, robust forms of uh, uh, mechanisms in which people are expressing themselves. The other person I want to talk about is my friend Neha Dikshit, who is a brilliant journalist in New Delhi and in India. And she grew up in Lucknow. And in fact, her parents were not happy that she was going to be a journalist. And she has written superbly on human trafficking by the RSS, uh, the child trafficking actually it is cases of child abuse she has written about. She has written about gender-based violence very well and on extrajudicial executions. She's one of those hard-hitting, gutsy, solid reporters. But the kind of sexualized language she gets, the kind of attacks she has get, have been so incessant that she, I mean, she, she's brave, she continues, but the abuse has gone on and on and on. People have even told her that, governments have told her that we know where you live, 
that kind of an argument. And, uh, um, and, and also that she has basically said that I am now forced to see myself as a victim and she resents that. She continues to operate in the space. She continues to write, which is all very good, but it is not something she chose. She said, I want to be brave as a reporter. I don't want to be brave by, you know, having to face down the trolls, but that's where we are. Another person I want to talk about is Supriti Dhar. She's Bangladeshi, Hindu by birth, atheist by choice, and, uh, and um, uh, writes on feminist issues and challenges religion of all sorts. Uh, she is now uh, living in Sweden in exile. And the reason is that she was, when the attacks against the bloggers started, I mean, those of you who know recent history of Bangladesh, uh, between 2016 and 17, 14 and 17, uh, something like 13 or 14 bloggers were either physically attacked or murdered. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of them have started moving out. Last week I was in Brussels at the International Cities of Refuge Network meeting, where I met many Bangladeshi writers, including young women writers, uh, who were writing feminist poetry or, you know, writing posts on Facebook, who were driven out and finally they ended up have creating new lives for themselves in essentially Northern European cities, which in a way makes them safe, but it also, there's a word in Chinese called zige, Z-I-G-E, which essentially means your local standing. And that is eroded in the process because they are no longer relevant in the discourse uh, and their relevance is restricted to the online space. That is what happened. And they often live in very friendly, very nice small towns in Sweden and Norway, completely cut off from their, uh, their, their society and, and, and you know, completely reliant on the online space to continue their activity. And, and I still remember one of the things that Supriti told me was that when she was writing about politics and went and complained to the local police in Dhaka, the police officer said, but you're a woman, why don't you write on flowers and cooking? Why do you have to write on religion? So these are the kind of responses that are given to them in order to, uh, in order to uh, prevent them from continuing their work. There's also Joanna Cruz, uh, who is um, a wonderful science, science fiction writer based in Philippines in Davao city. And she was made the explicit rape threats by the press of, by the people who were involved with the press officer of, um, um, uh, of then mayor of Davao, who is today now, today the vice president of Philippines the daughter of former president Duterte. So, I mean, a lot of these threats that I talk about typically tend to come from extremely powerful entities, but they are not the government. These are non-state actors and they're encouraged to act in this manner, pushed to act in this manner, and the government chooses to do nothing. And very often it subverts and inverts the argument of free speech, saying that these people are only exercising their free speech. You wrote critically about our religion, we will write critically about you. And it, it, it changes and it, it misses out the crucial point that Mariam was making earlier, which is that, you know, when the critic writes about a religion, they typically attack the idea, but the response is always personal and addressed on the person. And I think that's a point worth revisiting later on. And the sad story though about Kandil Baluch, who was, you know, just a flamboyant young woman in Pakistan, and she was killed by her brother because uh, she apparently brought dishonor to the family. And given the way Sharia law operates in Pakistan, um, the victim's family can forgive the perpetrator in this case. Now, the victim's family was, of course, Kandil's parents, and the perpetrator was a brother, so also uh, the, the, the son's parents. And they, they, so they condoned or, or, or you know, forgave their own son for having killed their daughter. And it, I mean, the National Human Rights Commission of Pakistan is incredibly angry about it. And I'm not sure exactly how it will, it will play out. But these kinds of deaths are not that rare. I mean, in India, there was Gauri Lankesh, a very fine writer in Canada. She was writing critically about Hindutva and she, people came on a motorbike in front of her house and ultimately killed her. In Russia, it was Anna Politkovskaya. She was getting threats online from uh, people who were close to Putin and she was killed. And then in, in Malta, it was Daphne Caruana Galizia. So my point is again, to show that this is not just a subcontinent or a developing country phenomenon. It happens even in the, in, in the more advanced countries and, and, and so on. So I think that's something worth bearing in mind. There's another type of uh, censorship that I do talk about. Yeah, so this, this is what my friend Victoria Wilk from, who's the head of digital safety at Penn America told me when I was writing the paper, that the whole point of online abuse is that it is meant to intimidate censor and silence women. And she kept telling me that don't forget that online abuse is not only online abuse, it leads to offline abuse. 
And the another area in which women tend to get crowded out is a so-called gamer gate scandal. Now, I don't know how many of you remember that, but a lot of people like to play games online with people they don't know. I have friends who play chess with them, I have friends who play poker online. We all play Wordle or some such game every day, but these are multiplayer games. But as soon as the uh, some of the men find out that the person they are playing with at the other end is a woman they again start sexualizing the, their vocabulary and insulting them and trying to get them out of it and there has been a lot of work done around it and a considerable amount of research being done around it in the united states now there's good news and bad news always the bad news is that these things are going on and on and on unrestrained but there is some amount of good news and which is that the companies are becoming aware of it it's just that they lack the tools I do a fair amount of work on business and human rights. And one thing that you, you, re, you often realize is that companies, platform, online platforms create the illusion of free speech. They create the illusion of it being a public space. We think Twitter is public space. It is not. It is a private property of Mr. Elon Musk. It's a bit like how a supermarket or, or a shopping mall looks to us like a public space because there's free entry and free exit. But if you break any laws there, you can be stopped. And this was a famous case, I think, in the US a few years ago, where there was a pro-choice group and, and, and pro-life group uh, on abortion, and they had stalls opposite each other. And the mall decided to kick both of them out in the end because it was going to lead to a lot of acrimony there. So you cannot, just because it's a public space where people come to shop, it doesn't mean you can say what you want. And the mall is within its right to enforce that. And the same kind of demand is being placed now on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. At one level, this would seem like the right thing to do, because if the whole notion of internet is that you're able to speak truth to power, you want those who are uh, using the power not to abuse it and to place some restraints on it. That seems like a, a legitimate way to go. But, and, and, and of course that gets confused by talking about it in terms of uh, free speech for everybody. But, you know, it depends on free speech is ultimately if it is the free speech of the owners of the space itself, that's a problem. The way in which Musk has started bringing people back on Twitter with certain kinds of reputation and certain kinds of ideological predilection, that is an issue. And so what Twitter had a trust and safety council, right? And I was on part of it. I was not the only one, there were about 25 or 30 of us on it. And unceremoniously, without any warning, we were disbanded when Mr. Musk took over. And the rationale being that our content moderation was chilling free speech. And that was a rationale given at that time. Fine, I mean, it's, it's his playground and he can set the rules. Facebook has tried to address it in another way. They've created this new panel of experts who, to whom you can go with complaints. So if my account is closed down, I can go there and complain. And then if the complaint is valid, then I'll have to be reinstated. Now, like all Supreme Courts, only some cases go there, which are uh, the rarest of the rare variety. So the routine censorship, shadow banning, and all that happen is very hard to get out of. So it becomes an extremely frustrating exercise for women who want to be online and use it for a range of issues. I mean, I gave the example of sexualization. Rana Ayub, the great uh, um, and excellent um, in, um, investigative reporter from India, who happens to be a Muslim, and uh, the kind of hounding she gets, her images were morphed on a pornographic video. And you know, she she was she was very profoundly upset by the experience that she went through. Those videos were being sent to her family members and, and things like that. Deep fake and its use has also increased a lot. Now, Google has taken steps, Facebook has taken steps. They have prevented deep fakes from being used. These are artificial videos created. Now, I don't know how many of you saw this, but I think uh, two or three weeks ago, there was a video of a speech which you thought it was Joe Biden speaking because the face was his, the voice was his, but it was an extremely anti-LGBT speech. And you know, it's the kind of speech that even a rabid but mainstream Republican senator or congressman would not make. It was that, that nasty, that speech. But you felt it was Biden speaking it. And I saw it being discussed among anti-gay groups that this is what uh, this is what Biden has finally come around on our side is the way it was being talked about. So these deep fakes are creating a real problem. There's very little regulation there. And um, of course you can't, don't want to ban it altogether because deep fakes can have a very meaningful role as satire, right? It would probably, you know, make sure that, you know, a lot of things that we take for granted, granted for humor, that will also get banned if it is not, not allowed. So the problem though, is that the companies which are at the heart of this issue, often take these decisions entirely based on their own lived experience, which is culture specific, 
which is not informed by a diverse set of viewpoints and which ends up coming out and coming out with solutions and so on that attempt to implement either their old laws or a very vague understanding of international human rights law on free speech. And, and, and it's, it's vague and, and I think it's much better if it is done in, in a manner in which it includes consultation with stakeholders. Now, I know the pitfalls of that, because as soon as you talk about consultation of stakeholders... Salil, really... I just need to tell you to get you to wind up a bit, please. Yeah, and, no, I'm, I'm on my last thanks, minute. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm literally on my recommendation. I'm on the last part of it. So all that you need is that for a very representative system of people coming together, stakeholders who know, who always veer on the side of free speech and take to heart this central tenet that is a powerful and the powerless and the powerless have to be able to speak and the powerful have to be restrained. So the classic dimension of human right has to be brought into the picture. Only then we will be able to realize a dream that the online space has promised and has failed to deliver and has turned it into what the old sock culture um, phenomenon of the Usenet groups used to be. And that's where we are headed, which is terrible. I'll stop there. Thank you, Salil. Well, I was loath to interrupt you considering the subject that you were speaking about. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll now move on to our final speaker, um, who is um, Pragna Patel. Um, and Pragna is going to be talking about the APPG Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism. Um, Pragna Patel is the ex-director and founding member of South All Black Sisters Advocacy and Campaigning Center and also of Women Against Fundamentalism. She's also a member of Feminist Descent and has written extensively on race, gender and religion. And um, she's also um, an editor of issue six of Feminist Descent. Thank you and over to you, Pragma. Thank you very much, Georgie. Um, it's great to be here amongst friends and others um, to have this really, I think, urgent and important debate. Um, my contribution is going to look at the, um, my experiences of giving evidence on the concept of Islamophobia to the all-party parliamentary group on the issue. And, um, and, and I want to talk both about the process by which I gave evidence as well as how that evidence was received. Um, and, you know, I concur with everybody else um, who's spoken before me who've said, that of clearly we're at a moment in time when we're facing an increasingly multi-directional assault on free speech that's mounted not only by the state, but non-state um, actors, um, including corporations, but also right-wing actors um, that Stephen and um, Mariam and others have talked about in relation to fundamentalism and so on. Um, and of course, I think a lot of uh, the attack on free speech comes from the politics of identity. Um, and I think what Stephen talked about when he talked about Christian fundamentalism, far right, is as much about, and, and nationalisms that others have talked about, is as much about identity politics as anything else. Um, and I think that that identity politics is as reliant on the spread of disinformation as it is on the suppression of information. And to that extent, many on the left are also mired in regressive identity politics that engenders its own culture of dogmatism and censorship. And I, particularly, for example, con concepts like emotional harm, hate speech, are increasingly weaponized by those on the left as well as the right to silence internal debate and criticism, generating not just authoritarianism from above, but also authoritarianism from below. Um, and anyone who challenges the regressive logic of current forms of identity politics, whether one the basis of religion, cancel culture and censorship, as Marion has talked about. So minority religious right forces in the UK are particularly in the language of an emotional harm siege, and it has become a means by which to mount an even greater assault on democratic freedoms and rights. 
Um, in the wake of the feminist and Black Lives protest following the murder of Sarah Everard and George Floyd in the US, we saw the UK government introducing a new draconian criminal law, the Police Crime Sentencing Courts Act 2022, to curb protests and to criminalize those who damage historical statues and memorials. And the objective of that law and piece of law is clearly to restrict the right to freedom of assembly and freedom of expression, which is hugely problematic, whatever one thinks of the toppling of statues on the basis that they symbolize British colonialism. Um, responding to the proposed law during a parliamentary debate, um, the Bradford West MP Nash Shah, uh, who is also the shadow minister for cohesion and um, for community cohesion, criticized the move, that is the introduction of the law, but somewhat bizarrely, not out of concern for its highly authoritarian underpinnings, but because the law sought to protect secular statues and not religious sentiments. Uh, missing the point entirely, she was in effect advocating for blasphemy laws to be introduced and for the right not to be offended to be introduced into the very heart of legal and public discourses in a way that dangerously came close to the reintroduction of blasphemy laws through the back door. And despite the abolition of blasphemy, blasphemy laws in the UK in 2008, religious fundamentalists in particular have stepped up attempts to utilize legal and social policy spaces at the domestic and international levels to protect religion and to punish those who are seen to defame religion. Conflating the concept of blasphemy with the concept of hate speech and race hate crimes has always been the go-to strategy of fundamentalists of all hues ever since Islamists used the opportunity uh, presented by the publication of the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie to mobilize around a regressive political agenda an agenda that corrodes core principles of democracy, fetishizes religious identity and promotes religious intolerance and Their politics have benefited, their political projects rather, have benefited greatly from positioning themselves within the British multi-faith and economic neoliberal framework that has created the space for them to flourish. And it's this backdrop that I needed to set out that um, against which I want to recount my experiences of challenging unsuccessfully efforts made by the Muslim right, uh, Muslim religious right, with support from their sympathizers to adopt an official definition of Islamophobia in social policy and the law. So I was asked to give evidence to um, the all party parliamentary group, oral evidence that is, to a consultation hearing on Islamophobia organized by the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, and I call them the APPG for short. As chair of the APPG, Baroness Wasi and her allies were intent on creating a working definition of Islamophobia modeled along similar lines to the controversial International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. In the course of my submissions, I argued that far from addressing the reality of anti-Muslim racism, the concept of Islamophobia blurs the line between hate speech and freedom of speech and serves only to authoritarianism and the social control of freedom of expression. I also said that it would lead religious forces in other, religious right forces in other minorities to follow suit um, in the name of protecting their support purported religious sensitivities. The process of giving evidence itself was instructive because I had not been provided in advance with a copy of the draft definition of Islamophobia. And then I was sandwiched between other witnesses who all approved of having a definition of Islamophobia. And I quickly realized that I had been invited to give the proceedings an air of impartiality since my views were subject to hostile interrogation by the chair Baroness Wasi. Instead of seeing the occasion as an exercise in evidence gathering, she took 
the she took on the task of chief prosecutor, judge, and jury um, in relation to the comments that I made. But I remained resolute in my opposition to the proposal for a number of reasons. First, I argued that Islamophobia was an ambiguous term that meant different things to different people and conflated anti-Muslim discrimination or prejudice with legitimate criticism of Islam. Um, secondly, I said that it would be primarily used to protect Islam from any form of criticism and to foster a culture of censorship, including violent censorship. As we've seen, not just in the threats that culminated in the attempted murder of Salman Rushdie last year, but in other situations too. For example, the murder in 2016 of Asad Shah, the Ahmadi Muslim living in Scotland, who was deemed by his killer to have blasphemed against Islam and to have so-called disrespected the Prophet Muhammad and who therefore needed to be eliminated. Thirdly, I argued that the term would amount to a gendered form of censorship since it would be used largely to police minority women, feminists, Muslim female feminists, Muslim feminists and others who are more vulnerable to accusations or about um, transgressing conservative and fundamentalist norms around the family and the role of women. And most of my frontline work has involved undoing precisely the tight grip that religious fundamentalist leaderships have over women that limit their autonomy and access to protection, equality and justice. Fourthly, I said that the term would undermine solidarity in the struggle against racism because it seeks to differentiate racism towards Muslims from that experienced by other minorities, thus exceptionalizing Muslim victimhood. I unpicked many of the case examples the APPG had given on what it deemed to be Islamophobia and showed that when examined closely, they were really cases of racism and racial violence against Muslims, which were in content no different to the forms of violence faced by other minorities, including migrants. I argued that the term anti-Muslim racism was more appropriate and preferable because it located hatred towards Muslims within the paradigm of racism, and in doing so had the potential to create alliances and solidarity between all groups who face racism. This was one of, it, this. in fact, the, the kind of attempts to form solidarity and alliances was one of the most more positive dimensions of the secular anti-racist movements of the 70s and 80s in which minorities of all backgrounds often came together based on the commonality of their experiences of racism, marginalization, and exclusion. Fifthly, I said that any definition that suppressed freedom of speech was likely to fall foul of Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights on Freedom of Expression, which is crucial to the democratic project and to hold power to account. In fact, um, ECHR case law has determined that those who choose to exercise the freedom to manifest their religion cannot reasonably expect to be exempt from all criticism. Of course, all of these views were rejected outright and the APPG went on to promote a highly problematic definition of Islamophobia. On, eight, on, on 28th November, 2018, the APPG produced a report entitled Islamophobia Defined, the inquiry into a working de definition of Islamophobia. And it makes clear that Islamophobia, and I quote, Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. So you can see immediately why this definition is worrying. Nevertheless, the authors justified it with reference to the work of academics like Tariq Modoud from Bristol University, who was purported to develop a five-fold test that distinguishes between so-called reasonable criticism of Islam and Muslims and Islamophobic speech. However, I find his test really troubling and disingenuous. Quite apart from the fact that Tariq Modud himself has publicly stated that Salman Rushdie and those defending him are engaged in Islamophobia um, or Islamophobic behavior, an accusation that has violent consequences, as we've seen, 
His tests are vague and they turn on the question of what constitutes reasonableness, which in turn relies heavily on subjective meanings. They ultimately reinforce the idea that religion must be protected from criticism. And it's moves like this that have helped to create a climate conducive to ridiculing and even um, perpetrating violence against those who dissent. For example, the extremist and fundamentalist linked organization CAGE described the legal intervention of South and Black Sisters in the organization um, INSPIRE in the appeal court case on gender segregation in a co-ed co co faith-based school, the Al Hijra school, as Islamophobic. Cage essentially accused us of following the prevent agenda. The point of such accusations is of course to stop any questioning of religious rules, such as those on gender segregation, which quite appropriately could be described as gender apartheid. Nevertheless, despite all of these concerns that I and others have raised, the definition of Islamophobia has since been accepted by several local authorities, as well as police and crime commissioners and other public bodies across the UK. I just want to say that there are two aspects of the APPG episode that have particularly disturbed me. The first is the lack of transparency concerning the actors behind the drafting of the definition of Islamophobia. One of the key persons, as I found out later, uh, behind the scenes was Dr. Antonio Pereira, who helped prepare the report, member of the organization MEND, which also works in partnership with CAGE. And both these groups present themselves as community welfare organizations, but they are controversial due to their links to fundamentalist networks. Their real agenda is to to capture social policy and gain political power on the back of fundamental. In other words, we can't ignore the fact that the creation of the deliberately ambiguous definition of Islamophobia is directly connected to fundamentalist political projects. And the other troubling aspect about the whole thing is that fundamentalists from other religions have since followed in the same vein, just as I had predicted, in my oral and, and written submissions to the APPG. For example, seeking to ape the success of the Islamic far right, right wing Hindu forces in the UK have sought to introduce an official definition of Hindu phobia into the public sphere. For a number of years, the Hindu right have mobilized to ban exhibitions, plays, films, and policies and laws that are deemed to offend so called Hindu sensibilities. But in June 2021, an early day motion EDM was tabled by six Labour MPs and sponsored by another 40 MPs from across the political parties that called for an end to so-called Hindu phobia. In the debate that followed, examples of cases of racism against Indians were cited from a study conducted by the, by the 1928 Institute an organization purporting to represent the views of Indian Hindus in the UK. They claimed that the case studies were in fact examples of Hindu phobia. But when examined again closely, it is evident that they were more about racism towards Indians because they were perceived to be from a minority or immigrants. There is nothing to suggest that they were explicitly targeted because they were Hindus. As with the Muslim right, this tells us that the real agenda of the Hindu right is not to confront racism. In fact, they have no history or track record of having done so, given if you think about their opposition to anti-caste discrimination laws, for example. Nor is there, there, no, their real aim is threefold, to assert a political Hindu identity in public policy, to insert Hindu phobia as a hate crime, in the government's hate crime action plan, and to create a strategy on challenging Hindu phobia, all of which is likely to amount to the policing of any form of internal dissent from the Hindu nationalist project within the Indian diaspora. So in conclusion, I want to say that terms like Islamophobia or Hindu phobia echo the worldview of the religious right and significantly, significantly harm the cause of anti-racism precisely because the fundamentalist agenda is antithetical to equality and human rights principles, including
including the right to freedom of expression. Yet parts of the left have remained silent to this danger, if not actively supported moves to place religious identities beyond criticism or to close it off from critical interrogation. Indeed, it is a paradox of our times that the left has become skeptical of, if not hostile to the principles of free speech, given that free speech is once an integral part of the struggle for equality and social justice, including anti-racist struggles. I, I believe that the correct term to use in respect of hatred and discrimination towards minorities is racism. Whether it is anti-immigration racism or anti-Muslim racism, the point is that it is part of a continuum of racism that ought to be fought together. The urgent task that lies before us is to find ways of challenging the reality of racism and indeed other forms of structural inequality, whilst also reclaiming the value of free speech as part of a wider progressive left politics. So I think I'll end there. I hope that's within my, my 12 minutes. Your 12 minutes, but oh, that's sorry. no problem. <laughs> sorry. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Pragna. Thank you very much. Um, all of our speakers um, and also if any of our um, other again for all of the contributions that you've made uh, um, to the journal um, and I think um, somebody put up a, a link to um, issue six um, in the chat so please do um, uh, re refer to that and have a, have a look at it um, so now we're going to move on to and discussion. I think that there may have been some put in the chat um, as uh, speakers were talking. So I think what we'll do is we'll start off with um, Rashmi going back to anything that's in the chat, and then we'll move on to um, hands up and people making um, contributions um uh you know speak uh speaking to the speakers directly so um rashmi are there some questions for you to um read out yes um that was a fantastic session uh thank you everyone and um so i'm going to keep my camera off because my internet is a little unstable uh but i can see that there's a first comment that perhaps Stephen or Neera, I think, who's also with us, either of them or both of them, may want to respond to, which is a comment from Alison Wren, who says that she can't believe you're using the pejorative term anti-vaxxers. Many people believe, many, many, many people were vaccine skeptics and opposed to mandates which affected poor <laughs> working class women, 50,000 of them sacked from their care work jobs and increasing evidence of serious vaccine damage and death, Pfizer having an exemption from paying any compensation. Follow the money always. Uh, Stephen, uh, do you have any response to this? Yeah, I, I do. Um, just to say that we, in the article itself, Alison, we did distinguish between vaccine hesitancy yeah the, these were people who had understandable concerns about the vaccine with the ideology of the um of those who are overtly prom promoting conspiratorial viewpoints so we, we recognize that there are people who who you know have all sorts of reasons for being concerned about vaccination you know we in the article, we tried to articulate the idea that uh, we understand, you know, we, we saw that we saw the campaign to promote vaccination as in the is in the public good as in the as in, um, as, you know, is promoting public health, but we equally understand that, you know, um, campaigns of vaccination have been used oppressively against racialized minorities against women you know, the, the Deepu Pravira um, campaigns that forced terminations on Indigenous women in Australia and the United States, you know, so that, so it isn't simply the case that, you know, um, 
public health campaigns can't be weaponized against minorities. We fully grasp that point. But equally, our focus was on those groups consciously and deliberately promoting um, conspiratorial theories. So I hope that's clarified that question. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, there's another comment. Georgie, should we go through what's in the chat or invite? If people want to ask questions, they can raise hands and yeah, call on them as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. If we go, if we go um, through the ones that are on the chat to start with. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is, I guess, it's inviting comment, and it could be any of the speakers uh, who could, you know, I guess, address this. Uh, this is Amy who writes, it would be good for this talk or panel to consider freedom of speech. And I'm wondering if choice was meant there in relation to bodily autonomy without judgment or name calling. Let's see how the debate expands. So um, I'm not exactly sure. what. I could, do you want me to comment on that? It's Amy here. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so um, I, I also didn't particularly like the um, the the anti-vaxxer thing because I think people on the left and right, including clever people like all you panelists who spoke beautifully, by the way, all of you, thank you, need to be really careful about terminology and how it can replicate um, ideas of dominance and and who's right or wrong. And the the idea that things are done to women or done to black and brown bodies, like you must have a vaccine or you must have a termination. I think most women, I think all, all feminists, most women are really sensitive to being done to. So I I was wondering about the, the position of, um, you know, the whole when Stephen was speaking about the anti-vax type stuff and how it you know it can be really quite painful emotionally for women to hear that that we should have done a certain thing but but I because of you know the fact that we don't always have bodily autonomy however that's that's what I was thinking but I think Stephen's clarified in his answer to the first speaker what the, what the position was so but I mean any of you can speak but I'm I, I don't I don't need clarity anymore thank you Amy uh, thank you. I just wondered whether Alison wanted to, Alison Wren, who asked the question in the beginning, wanted to um, comment at all on the response. Um, Alison, you have to unmute. Yes, I'm still a little perturbed about this anti-vaxxers, you know, and anyone who questioned that we all had to be vaccinated um, was banned from YouTube. And I did watch a very disturbing um, YouTube from Dr. John Campbell of one MP in the House of Lords, the House of Commons, and one other person there supporting him. And the whole house was empty. And he was looking at figures from Pfizer about the actual cost of making everybody have vaccines in the UK. And we still have excess deaths. There is a lot of evidence about it, but definitely the free speech of people who wanted to question, like the Barrington Declaration people, who wanted to question that this was actually the right response was severely shut down, which is why it's the whole follow the money. Seventh most popular investment in Congress, in congressmen is Pfizer and Moderna. They, they set it up and it, we will find the same with our government and probably on both sides of the house. And I felt Labour let us all down severely by not being the opposition. They all went along with it. Uh, and I just find it very concerning. That's, that's all I have to say. And I really, really... ...vaccinations. I know I'm okay so that's all I'd like to say thank you very much thank you Alison um uh, me yeah yeah there's a question um, for Salil can you hear me 
Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so there's a question uh, from Subir for Salil, uh, which says social media is a pseudo public space. Would you agree, Salil? Increasingly, these spaces are ruled by the right, far right. Now you can have accounts blocked or YouTube can remove content for political favorites. So if you want to respond to that. So yeah, they, they create the appearance of being public spaces, but we have to recognize that they are private spaces. They are like newspaper, uh, radio stations, television. They are not publicly owned. I mean, they, they may, they're not even necessarily held, owned by the stock market and, and investors. And as in the Elon Musk and Twitter example, he is the sole owner, so it is his playground. Uh, and yet they do create the illusion of being a public space there. They do have public obligations, but those are not necessarily rooted in law. And they do follow the law. I mean, Musk also said that he will comply with the law of every country in which Twitter operates, and which is why he complies with Narendra Modi in India and takes down 122 accounts as he did last week uh, or a couple of days ago, Twitter has done that. So that is, in fact, that is the risk. And which is why it's one of those very strange situations where we can trust neither the so-called, you know, Californian liberal libertarian model, because that's also applied in, in, in certain contexts, nor can we trust the state. And therefore we need, a, we need a different kind of governance. I'm not yet sure whether where we are and how biased it would be towards freedom as it goes forward. But it, in, 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 you know, on, if you were to write a newspaper in, in Guardian tomorrow and, and in a Guardian, if you were to write an article saying that all asylum seekers should be sent back because there is no room, Guardian editor would be very well within his, her right to not publish it. Uh, we do not get automatically get the right to publish in a platform of our choice. What the internet does provide is a way for us to create our own network somewhere else. If it's not on YouTube, maybe on Vimeo, maybe on some other forum and go and put our documents out. Now, I agree that most people will go to YouTube and Facebook and Google and, and Twitter and Instagram, and therefore your voice will get crowded out. But it's not as if you're completely being kept out of the system. And that's, that's all. I mean, I'm, I'm observing it. I'm not justifying it. And it's an unequal field, but that's, that's what I would like to say. Okay, thank you, Salil. Uh, there's lots to talk about on this, uh, but let's move on to this question from Surinder Guru, who says, it's clear how misogyny, racism, homophobia, etc., coalesce in far-right and religious fundamentalist discourses. To what extent, if any, does class inequality and changes, usually excluded from identity politics, play in the toxicity they represent. Sorry, they present. Um, I don't know, is it to Pragna? Pragna, do you want to, since you talked about identity politics? Yeah, um, I think, I think um, it's not just misogyny or racism or homophobia that, that uh, is used, uh, you know, that is the kind of underlings of religious fundamentals discourse they mobilize um, the class inequalities in particular they use they refer to class inequalities and uh, changes multiculturalism and so on as a way of mobilizing the white working classes too so and the rhetoric there is exactly the kind of rhetoric that Stephen about when he talked about you know um the need to, the, you know, the, the way in which the uh, white nationalists um, portraying themselves as being under siege, the majority being the minority, um, and the threats that are come from migrants and and uh, women and, and others. So I think that the thing about class is that they've been able to mobilize effectively the inequalities that the poor face, the kind of growing inequalities and disparities in wealth, um, the distrust. And, you know, I think a lot of the earlier discussion around, um, you know, COVID pandemic and the anti-vaxxers and so on is very much about the distrust of state, of, of power, of, of state power, of the state, of the government, of those in power. And, you know, so they, they kind of mobilize that kind of distrust they're able to um, tap into all of that to 
really um, get to, to portray this sense, to entrench this sense that actually it is the, the majority whites in this country who are under siege. So I actually think class plays into what's going on in very fundamental ways. But I think the problem is that the left has failed to deal with this properly. Um, um, and I think that even if we look at what the Labour Party at the moment stands for, it actually is trying to court the red wall, the votes, you know, of those um, uh, in constituencies where things hang in the balance. And so I feel that very much so that the left has also failed to look at um, inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities, um, in a way that bridges the divides between black and, and white and across different groups, because, you know, uh, the poor, whether they're black or white, still represent the majority in this country. And we're not doing enough to find ways of bridging those gaps between different groups, bringing class back into our analysis to, to meet the daily realities that you know the, the, the poor face, the cost of living crisis, the years of austerity, the disparities that were so viscerally highlighted by the pandemic, the racial disparities, but also you know class inequalities. So I actually think that the, the, the task is for us to try and move away from identity politics and start talking about sort of structural forms of inequalities and how we can work together across the divides to tackle those structural forms of inequalities. Thank you, Pragna. And I think my internet is better now. I actually was wondering if we could bring Mariam into this discussion as well, uh, because I was curious in terms of whether the very idea of identity politics has any resonance for the kind of work you do and also the relationship of that with structural inequalities. Mariam, if you want to come sure, in. Sure, I mean, yeah, definitely I agree that when it comes to identity politics, uh, it doesn't look at the structures of oppression and it doesn't look at class, social and political movements, and it looks at one identity of many identities. The reality is that we all have innumerable identities that could represent us that we use on a daily basis in our lives. But this focus on just one identity is a way of um, removing any other aspect of that identity and making that the only authentic represent representation of the so-called group or society. So as an example, um, if you look at the Muslim community, very often you see that uh, it is the Islamists who are seen to be the authentic representatives of that community. And if you are not veiled, if you don't support Sharia law, if you don't uh, support sex segregation, then you are not a representative of that community. And so, I mean, there's so many examples of this, for example, um, going to stop the war coalition protests and the, them saying women should veil in solidarity with the women of Iraq, uh, you know, whereas so many women in Iraq and in that region are fighting against compulsory veiling and veiling rules. Um, and so this, this idea that, you know, to be authentic, there is only one way of being authentic. And what it does is that who determines what is authentic, who determines what uh, the identity of that group or community or society is, it's those in power. And very often, you know, if you're looking at, let's say, the Muslim community or places where the religious right are, are in power or have a lot of influence, it's the religious right making that determination. So, you know, it, we're in, during Ramadan now, and a lot of us are expected not to eat because of out of respect. But I remember living in Iran when we had family members who were fasting and others who weren't, and we could eat, and they were fasting and they were there also speaking and, and 
enjoying company but not eating whereas now I mean I just spoke to someone who runs a disabilities workshop drumming workshop and he said that out of respect of uh, the Muslim staff there the uh, uh, the the drumming students uh, who had disabilities weren't allowed to have their usual biscuits and and drinks and that that is you know absurd if you're if you're fasting fine good luck to you I think fasting um, uh, during Ramadan for me it, it's a very very bad period because it you know we remember all the pressure and intimidation and the flogging and the arrest that come with those who defy fasting rules and who drink or smoke or whatever they do um, um, and they're not allowed to and even here in Britain you often have if you've got a Muslim name or you look Muslim and you want go and buy something at a shop, they'll say, well, how come you're not fasting, sister? None of your fucking business why I'm not fasting. But this whole idea of identity politics is such that people feel that they have a right to ask you that and put pressure on you. You know, so I do think there is that thing where it is very much those in power who are determining it. And it's completely removing the social, political, economic structures that are causing the inequalities and also to see us as multifaceted human beings that are struggling for things and demanding rights and freedoms outside of this very narrow identity that's imposed on us. Thanks, Mariam. Um, King Antonia. <laughs> I don't know your name. <laughs> You've added a couple of comments in relation to this, and you said you'd like to speak. I have. Muted? Thank you very yeah. much. My name's Tony. Hi. I mean, lots of stuff's come out of this discussion on lots of different levels. I think one of the concerns... Oh, God, there's so much to be concerned about, isn't there? I was, I've been listening to Radio 4 and Radio 5 about housing and the lack of affordability. I'm 77 and I was born at the end of the Second World War, when my mother was both a single parent and we were homeless. And I cannot believe that we've gone back 75 years. If we're going to have a, a decent society where everybody can have a voice, we need to have education. We need to invest in education. We need to invest in housing. And that is not happening because nobody, or the ones that have the power, which is why I said, you know, who has the power, are willing to, to do that, including the fucking Labour Party, who are an absolute travesty, saying that they want to represent people. Um, that's what I wanted to say, really. Thank you. Um, Georgie, we also want a round of speakers sort of wrapping up and addressing each other. Do we have time for another question yeah. or two, or um, so should we move on to that? I think the there's a question about um from Miriam. Yes, that yeah. So, so, we ask so that and then have the yeah, wrap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a question from Miriam Yagud. Uh and this is addressed to Pragna, but I think anyone can come in. Uh, Pragna, many gender critical women who identify as feminists are engaging with far right and extremist groups. Some of us see platforming racists and nationalists as damaging the campaign uh, to halt the forward march of gender ideology. Those of us airing criticism of this tactic are being reviled and accused of siding with the anti-feminist left. Do you have any thoughts on this complex situation? Oh boy, um, we could have a whole separate webinar on this really. I mean, I find the situation, if it wasn't complicated enough, just incredibly dangerous and difficult. Um, it's incomprehensible that Feminists should want to engage with the far right and extremist groups. I am one of those people who have questioned gender ideology, um, but I cannot for the life of me understand why that should lead people 
even if they're critical of the, you know, of the gender ideology, ideological movement, why that should lead them into the arms of the far right and the religious right and extremist groups. Um, it just makes a mockery of what is feminism. It raises the question of you know, how are, are we really going to go back to sort of talking about what feminism means? I cannot see this as part of any egalitarian agenda. It is nothing to do with feminism as far as I'm concerned. How you align yourself with the kind of Christian and far right that Stephen talked about, who have an agenda which is to absolutely decimate women's reproductive rights, to you know, undermine the struggle for reproductive justice because you want a short-term alliance with them to defeat the gender ideologies is just short-termism of the worst kind. Um, and it really blurs, I think, the line between feminism and the right. Um, and I really feel that actually what we do have to do is go back to the vision of feminism as a transformatory, as transformative project. Um, and if we can't carry people with us because, you know, they want to make alliances with those who would also denigrate women, uh, women's bodies or minorities or migrants or the poor, well, then, you know, we, we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't be really involved in feminism at all. Just join that side, for God's sake, and get on with it. And then we know who it is, what it is that we have to deal with. And but it certainly isn't feminism, and and they certainly do not speak for feminism. There are a lot of a lot of us who would challenge both gender ideology as well as challenging the far right and the extreme right. Um, you know, and that's what we've always done is which is tried to sort of involve in a multi-directional struggle against all of this. None of this is easy. None of us have said this is easy. It's complex. But, you know, this kind of short termism or this kind of idea that you can just align with anyone just because you, you know, you want to gain something um, immediately is just about, you know, so I don't know, it's kind of neoliberal sort of sort of culture of, you know, immediate gratification as far as I'm concerned, I can't understand it. And, it, uh, you know, I certainly don't think that that's what feminism should be about. Can I just add something to that? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, I think uh, it, it. I completely agree with Pravna. I mean, I th and I see this a lot with ex-Muslims as well. You know, certain ex-Muslims who uh, join the far right, who collaborate with the far right, and I found uh, that you know a lot of our work has to be not just against the Islamists, but against the far right, against racism as well. And the point we always make is that we have to fight on many different fronts. And the example I always give is that, uh, you know, it's sort of how the, this, um, this idea that my enemy's enemy is my friend sort of thing. Um, and I think we need to look at what our end goal is, uh, what we're fighting for. And then I think it becomes easier to find your real allies. Um, you know, and an example I would give is, for example, I'm against U.S. militarism. So that means I should then be collaborating with Hezbollah and the Islamic regime of Iran and the Taliban. Forget their politics on women and their misogyny and and are they really actually anti-imperialist? No, they're not. So I think, again, it's if, if it's looking at it from a very narrow prism and not looking at what is trying to be achieved in the struggle. And I think if one does that, it becomes a lot easier to see who the real allies are. I mean, clearly the far right is, I don't think the far right has ever been a poster child for feminism. You know, uh, we, we haven't said yes, you know, all the advances for women's rights is thanks to the fascists. Um, and, and so it, I think just looking at it from that perspective, it makes it very clear that they're definitely not allies and uh, we have to fight them and the religious right as well. Uh, and not to forget too, that while a lot of the left also collaborates with the religious right, that many of us here, I, I know for my, myself, Pragna, um, and I think Salil and Stephen as well, we are also on the left. And I think oftentimes that 
isn't very obvious. It's it's like, oh, this left, you know, the left that has an affinity towards the Islamists, um, that is anti-woman, that doesn't necessarily represent all of the left. And there's a lot of uh, us on the left that are fighting uh, for feminism, for freedom of expression, but we're somehow not considered left. And it's either the far right or the, you know, the left that is uh, anti-free expression, anti-feminist, uh, and pro religious rights and that's not really the case either thank you thank you mariam <laughs> stephen and, and salil would you like to um comment on this point but i come in on the back of that of mariam's comment please yeah um i i very much agree with pragna and and mariam i think you know and and what pragna said on the um on the um way that there are um, gender critical feminists who've got into political alliances with the extreme right. And I think the um, the woman Kelly J. Keane, um, po who, who goes as Posey Parker, is, a, is an example of that. And she's been a lot, she's had meetings with the Proud Boys, uh, many neo Nazi organizations. She's been allied with Tommy Robinson. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, I, fun, I thoroughly agree with um, Pragma on that, but I also feel I would also place the, the failure at the door of the left in very much the way that Pragna and Mariam have talked about. The left uncritically embraced identity politics and, and people who want to critically interrogate some of these identities are presented as bigots and, and face cancel culture. Part of the problem we're facing is that the left has embraced a kind of form of McCarthyism, yeah, where you can't speak out. And I think allied to this preoccupation with identity politics, and I think Pragn has really unpacked how it distracts us away from the underlying structural inequalities and the way these things are getting worse and worse. Racism and racial attacks are getting worse and worse, yet we increasingly compartmentalize that into, into specific identities instead of seeing the need for politically a politics of solidarity against that. And I really think that the left, um, in a sense, needs to reinvent its humanism. We need a new form of humanism on the left where, and, and what, you know, the, 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 the excellent contributions that have come from the floor and from the other speakers point to that so clearly. We need a new humanism that can speak to inequalities and understand those as structural products of capitalism. You know, the identities we see very are very often counterposed to each other, just as Pragna has sp spoken about in relation to Islamophobia and Hinduphobia. These are ways of dividing communities and creating competition for resources, not solidarity. So we need a new, a new humanism, a new left humanism, and a politics of solidarity. And that is the only way we can challenge the extreme right, who are equally swimming very successfully in this sea of identity politics. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Salil, before we before we wrap up, have you would you like to add to that or alternatively um, anything else that the discussion has raised for you? I mean, yeah, I would have spoken about the free speech versus hate speech versus dangerous speech, but I don't want to distract from what we are talking here. So I'll just like to point it out. I put the link to the work by dangerousspeech.org. It's worth looking at it because it really helps us distinguish between what is hate speech is saying that people who belong to X religion are stupid. Dangerous speech is to say they're stupid and therefore they should be killed. And particularly when the person saying they should be killed is someone from authority, uses coded language and makes the powerful feel they're persecuted. This was the trick of Milosevic. This has been the trick of many people. Erdogan has been doing it. To some extent, Trump, of course, did it. Boris Johnson did it. Modi has been very good at doing uh, at that too, which is to make the powerful feel that they are persecuted. And that's the problem here. But on, on the broader point, I think, you know, when you're extreme left and extreme right, in a way, we are circular and you are very close to yourself with one another. And one, one issue on which all of us were united in our different universes, because we were not um, in, at least I was not in Britain at that time, was a story about satanic verses. And 
Salman Rushdie. And we must remember that people who wanted the novel to be banned or tried uh, left didn't acquit itself very well at that time. You know? and, 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 and yes, Thatcher did support him, but reluctantly, uh, Lib Dems were at the forefront of defending him. Paddy Ashton was at the forefront of defending him. So we must remember that, that you know, because of the kind of politics that left has also played and its own ideas about the imperial view and imperialism and what Rushdie in their view might have represented. And this has come to backfire now on the Hindu right because the Hindu right thought that Salman Rushdie was their hero until he started talking about Hindus. His latest novel, Victory City, is a scathing attack on you know, the new mythology that Hindus are creating about themselves by, by showing how complicated it is. So I think this idea of you know whether it is left or right or liberal or conservative, the fact is that the agenda of humanism, as Stephen put it, needs to be reclaimed by people like us, if I can say that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salil. Um, so before finishing, would any of the speakers like to add any, any final word? Mariam? No? Okay, Pragna? Stephen? No. I think no. that's okay. Really good. Thank, you. thank you very much. Okay. That, well, so thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you, first of all, to the speakers and also to everybody else who contributed to this issue of the journal. And the conversations will be continuing. Um, thank you very much to everybody who's doing and who has been asking questions and participating in the discussion. So um, I've certainly learned a lot. And I, um, I'm looking forward, looking forward um, some of those ideas outside of this um, forum. And I hope that you have a very good evening on behalf of the Feminist Descent Collective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. -bye.